Yeah. Well, hey, everybody. My name is Jared Malat. I'm here with my good friend, Mateo Calise, and this is The Coltist, an Indianapolis Colts and Indiana Pacers podcast. Uh, so we try to get together every week or two, uh, especially during the off season, uh, yeah, to talk no. about what's been going on. Um, but really, this is season two, episode two, brother, uh, which we are going to call the CJ Stroud episode. Be And obviously... Just to lay it out there, brother, that's the dream, right? The Colts trade up to the second spot. Yeah. Ho- hoping Bryce Young to Houston. It, I think that's what's going to happen. And then do the Colts have enough to move up from four to two to take Stroud? I, I think is like the dream, right? Yeah. I mean, if you look at, you know, your franchise quarterbacks and quarterback, like we all agree that it is the most important position of all. Mm-hmm. And, you know, yeah, if you have to trade up from fourth to two to get it done, I mean, unless it's giving up, you know, a stupid price, like, I don't know, another first round pick, like the future first rounder to move just two spots, I don't want that. Yeah. But if it's reasonable, you know, you give up some, you know, perhaps a future second round pick, then a third, something like that, you know, I'm all for it. If that means, you know, only if it means I you're getting your guy, like you're getting the guy that you want and the guy that you're going to stand behind. Like if Chris Ballard and company believe that CJ Stroud is your guy and he could be the guy for the next 10 to 15 years and you pull the trigger unless it's way too stupid, the price they're asking for. If I remember correctly, it was the Chicago Bears who paid a hell of a price yeah. <laughs> uh for uh Mitch Trubisky, uh bless his heart. Um <laughs> um and so my my thought process here is I, I'm along the lines of what you're saying. Like there is a war there's a world where the Chicago Bears fumble the bag, and fumbling this bag is taking a reasonable offer from the Colts and letting them move up from four to two. And and yeah. here, here's here's the thing. I, I, again, I try to not brag nor boast. I'm a nobody. I'm in the first step of a million step journey, but I've got a little bit of time working with quarterbacks, scouting quarterbacks, assessing quarterbacks. And I can say pretty confidently, there's not a guy in this class I'm spending a bunch of capital on. And the reason I say that is because none of these guys are bulletproof. And until they start shitting out bulletproof quarterbacks, I just don't want to overspend and handicap my franchise to move up two spots when I'm like, I want to give up a third round, an extra third round pick, and maybe like a a later round pick next year. A a second, I'll give up a a third and a fifth to move a fourth to two. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not trying to. Yeah. yeah. and, And there is a world where Chicago trades out of the first pick with Houston, who wants to move up and get their guy. And then it's. Chicago and two, who, again, like we said, they've overpaid in the past for a quarterback. What's to say they don't undervalue that pick and give it up real easy. Colts sneak in there and get CJ Stroud, who I think is the gem of the draft. Um, uh, Obviously, there's also a, a world where he is the first overall pick. We do still have like the combine ahead of us where the hope is you'll get to see all these guys throw and really when it comes down to it, you know, when you now we're faced with having to look at a lot of Brock Purdy tape, right. And say like, yeah. what the hell happened? My favorite thing to say about that is watch Brock Purdy's tape in college and tell me you weren't like, yeah, he could actually sling it. Like he actually has a nice firm base. He throws a pretty, yeah, a pretty nice ball, a pretty accurate. He can throw with timing. Like he can actually play in this league. Will he come back from his injury? We don't know. But when it comes to C.J. Stroud, uh, a lot of people are looking for uh, apt comparisons. Um, the only thing I can come up with here, six four two fifteen is actually pretty big. Yeah. Um, and, and there aren't a lot of six four two fifteen. There's just not a lot of guys that are like six four. Um, and and I saw, I saw on the internet. I saw some like. 
Jared Goff 2.0 comparisons were, were like size and height and his ball placement, but you know, much more improved than him. Jared Goff is actually 6'4, 217. So they have a similar build. Okay. Six oh six and, three two fifteen is what they're saying. Holy Jared Goff is actually on his just finished his seventh NFL season. Damn, I feel old now. I thought yeah. he was like two or three years into the league. But yeah, Jared Goff is, in my opinion, like perhaps the most underrated quarterback in the NFL and just had his his best season yet with the with the Lions. Really yeah. nice season. So yeah, I think, guy, uh, yeah. well, I, you know, I've one of the things that I want to make sure that any player that plays for me knows that chip on your shoulder is the best weapon, man. It, it will do so much for your uh, desire to get better. And when Jared Goff got moved um, and it for Stafford and it cost Dallas additional capital, that has to put yeah, a, that has a little to, bit yeah. of a fire under you where it wasn't man for man. Like, it was you and somebody for Stafford, you know? And I think – uh, for a lot of players, a lot of players look at where that team's located in terms of is that a desirable place to play? And I think it kind of goes without saying, like any of these teams would be an honor to fucking play for. What are we talking about? Right? Talking like the best job in sports, being an yeah. NFL player, yeah, coach, the NFL player, coach, a commentator. Like, let's just talk, let's be real about it. Um, so when we think about uh, trading up, it's like you, I'm exactly we're in lockstep, brother. Like, I don't want to overpay if I'm the Colts. If I'm anyone else, I'm absolutely ecstatic if both the subject and title of our podcast is available at the two. Um, I You could also see a world where he goes one overall. And again, it, the closer we get, the more information we have. Like, for example, when we see these guys all throw at the, at the combine, yeah. I hope... My- my feeling is that, you know, like, you, you know that every draft process, it seems like from the end of the season, like the game stop and then some random quarterback just shoots up the board for for whatever reason. Yeah. I think that Ant- Anthony Richardson is going to be that guy. I think he puts up like ridiculous numbers at the combine. He's the best he athlete. Up, yeah. And I don't know. I, I, I think that if I had to put my money, you know, I would take Houston. To, perhaps they might take Anthony Richardson. Hey, you know what? Basically, I'm for that, you know, I'm for that that's... as well. Uh, yeah, anything I, I believe... anything that equals the Colts having other than staring down the barrel of Will Levis. Yeah. And it's it's not because I don't like the kid. I've watched his film. He's going to be an NFL player. I just want a better athlete. And from what I see, he looks like uh, what I see – uh six three two two forty four seven five forty and it's like yeah but the dn runs a four five so i need a guy that runs at least a four six something to give him a, a chance to get away uh and anthony richardson before the combine anyway is supposed to come in with a heater at four five he's supposed to have a four five forty that's before like you said, these games, they ain't been playing. So they got 90 plus days to get in the best shape of your life. Yeah. And and when you think about Anthony Richard, Anthony Richardson starting out with at least 15 hundredths of a second expected 40 over the rest of the field. So like he was projected to be the fastest quarterback in this yeah. class. And when you hear you're hearing me. Again, on the first step of a million step journey that has worked specifically a lot with quarterbacks, I think that there's a chance that, and again, I'm not even saying that they're listening to me, but like there are teams out there, they're going to be see his RAS score and they're going to be like, oh shit, we got to get Anthony Richards off the board. So I think there's also a world where that's true, right? Where, where he, because the thing I, again, when I think about, La- the last episode's title and subject, when I think about Bryce Young, I think teams reach for him because of his like poise and leadership and not yeah. because he's an insane athlete. And he's 
from what I've seen ahead of the combine again, and I'm making sure I say that because I don't ever people say like, oh, you said you was going to run in 465. You ran a 455. This is what I'm saying. Going into the combine, they're calling him as like a 190 pounds trying to get to 210. Yeah. And so you're telling me the kid's going to put on 20 pounds and he's going to run faster than the 47540 you had him running coming in here. And I'm just like, on what planet? So it's like, hey, now if he shits on me and he comes in here and runs a 460 at 210 priced on a bike, like, OK, now he's now he's he's had 90 days to figure it out. And I think that's what I'm really excited for. And that's what because I believe in people. <laughs> right. Like, I actually think that there there are man, it feels like there's like seven or eight guys in this class that can legitimately sling it. And and I get that, Jared, that's not going to happen. Right. But four or five or even six of those guys could start at some point. And that's a fucking lot. That's a lot of quarterbacks. And and again, I, I'm probably even wrong. And it's probably, probably really only more like four, Jared. And then you may have like a fifth or guy. But I just... When I look at these classes and what they're expected to be coming into the combine, it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, man, they got a lot of time where you can get a lot stronger and a lot faster and get a lot more pop on your ball. Because, again, we're be- we're all in football, in my opinion. If you didn't go do it and and, yeah. and and shake your head, if you did not go watch Brock Purdy highlight tape to figure out what did the NFL miss. Because – even the 49ers passed on him. And a lot of people yeah, are saying times. you go back and look at his tape and he's like a third, third or fourth round draft pick somehow slipped through the cracks. Now I think that it's because this, nobody wants to be a scout because scouts don't get any clout. And so you have people that are probably really good at talent evaluation that aren't working as scouts. They do other shit. And so the problem is, is that, for the longest time it takes to be a franchise quarterback. You have to have a college football coach with the experience in developing a quarterback so that you're delivering to the NFL, like a mature male that understands how this game operates around the quarterback, how important it is. Right. And again, I still don't think they're very good at developing them into being self-aware and like having the slightest bit of, uh, and you know the you don't you don't get the hair in the back of your neck don't stand up and you don't feel like you're gonna die like I I played quarterback and I can tell you when somebody gets within like a yard of me hair in the back of my neck stands up and I'm like oh god I'm gonna die especially when I'm wearing football pads and there's a pass rusher right and so it's either throw yeah. or go right and I think you can teach that and and like I said we are sitting here talking about Anthony Richardson because I do believe that based on what he was supposed to come in here looking like, what if he comes in here and runs a 4-4-1, brother? Yeah, which, yeah, which very well like, might happen. He, he, he's, he was, he, they were saying six months out, 4-5-0. They got shit to do for months. And I'm telling you, I just got done saying before, I think it was before we started, I hope it was start before we started recording, where I was talking about that chip on your shoulder is very powerful. And especially when... Bryce Young, skinny ass, is is being heralded as the the get of the draft, right? If I'm just about anybody else, I'm saying what I'm saying. That skinny motherfucker, like from Alabama, that had like blocking for weeks and talent out the ass around him, and like a coaching staff that's been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Come on, his little skinny ass. You got to be a bigger guy than that. Well, then the article comes out that he's trying to gain weight, and it's like, see, clearly. There was a narrative. It impacted what he's going to do with his body, right? And then I think that yeah. as a result of it, article comes out that um, Bryce Young's gaining weight. Well, a lot of guys are like, well, if he's going to gain 20 pounds and he's projected to run a 4.7540, I'm getting under that. I'm running a faster 40 than Bryce Young at the combine. And if if I'm an athletic trainer and I'm training a kid that's going to the combine, and I read an article that says the skinny 475 running 190 pound quarterbacks gaining weight and going to 210 on, on whose advice? I want my guys lean and as fast as fucking possible. What are we talking about? We're trying to make millions. Yeah. What are you talking about? 
Like, and if I'm any athletic trainer from, especially University of Florida, Ohio State, Kentucky. And by the way, one of the things I want to make sure I get on wax, holy shit, the University of Kentucky Athletic Training Department, fastest male in track, fastest female in track, and a top five quarterback, top five <laughs> draft pick quarterback in the same year. Like that's pretty impressive yes, out of yeah. out of out of the University of Kentucky. Like I've texted colleagues of mine that I know. Like wh- what are they feeding these kids in in, in Kentucky, in Lexington? Um, but yeah. So to talk about Bryce Young, I do watch a lot of Big Ten football. Uh, I do. Again, I've I've already said I think that he's the he's my get of the of the draft for the same reason that I think people would overpay for a guy like Anthony Richardson. Why? Because I see him as a better athletic prospect than a guy like Bryce Young, who's having to gain weight and already slated at a four, seven, five forty, where they're saying before the combine that Stroud at six, three, two thirty six is running a four, six forty. That's more than 90 days before the combine. And you're like, what if he comes in and runs a four, four, eight, and Stroud and and Bryce Young gain rate, and now he runs a four eight one, and it's like who you pick, right? Yeah. Um. And obviously, it kind of depends on on who's drafting you and what they want out of their guy. You know, um, if you kind of pay attention to the, I call it the shot chart, but it's the, it's the pass chart where they show you the depth of and where they're throwing the ball in the field most quarterbacks charts look like long rails on the outside because they take shots deep and then lots of shots lots of passes around three five yards of line of scrimmage um and then some over the middle but not much M- many quarterbacks are not confident throwing over the middle in the nfl um it's also because yeah. they also because they play a lot different coverage in the nfl and they roll a lot of coverage it's hard it's harder it's a lot easier to disguise stuff in the nfl because you guys are pros um, yeah basically but yeah, the the thing I can say that I saw see with Stroud that I don't see with a lot of quarterbacks is anticipatory uh, throws, um, having a lot of ball. Um, I don't know how to describe that to people that don't know what that means. Um, <laughs> but I feel like he had like I feel like he, his yeah that might be that might be a tough he has, one. To he describe. has a lot of ball. Uh, it's like his ball is super catchable. Um, it's it's not so much um, when you've got the kind of uh, like he's l- kind of length length uh, lanky, uh, and when he whips that ball out there, it's like it's floating. And so you when you go out to catch that, and it's you can because of the s- rotation on the ball, it's like it just floats in the air for a second. It's just a great catchable football. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he's got a lot of ball. A lot of guys don't have a lot of ball. Um, their ball doesn't have a lot of rotation. It's kind of flat, comes out, it's on target. It's it, it's spiral, but it, it doesn't have a lot of ball it's, to it. It's yeah, not it's... got a little bit of loft. There's no touch. It's all razors, right? Um, he, he throws a touch. He throws with anticipation. Um, and he can place it. Um, he's mobile. Uh, again, he, he's coming in as, as a little bigger, a little bigger guy with a, with wheels and that and again that's the that's the thing and for the future of the nfl uh, your quarterback's got to be the second best or best athlete on your team um and and i and i'm saying that for player safety um the the opposing the opposing team is taking its overall best athletes and trying to lean them all the way out and they're trying to get to the quarterback as fast as possible yeah so I think the plan at quarterback is, well, get the best athlete you can back there. That's as good of a passer as you can get. Know that even if you're really good at blocking, a considerable percentage of your quarter, the future quarterbacks in the NFL are going to have to pass out of the pocket. They're going to have to be able to roll and throw. And it's going to have to be built into your offense too. And I get it, I'm giving away game, but like, the NFL straight up told you last year, like 70% of completed passes are outside the pocket in the NFL because these guys are under dress, right? I also think there's several teams in the league that have like bad quarterbacks and you hope year to year that gets solved. But young, young guys don't often just win 
They don't even win the starting job, guys. So we are sitting here talking about, you know, your Bryce Young, your your Strouds, your Levis, your Richardsons. And again, I think it come, depends on what level of athlete shows up at the combine and is willing to put out because there's plenty of guys. There's plenty of reason based on what I just said where Bryce Young is going to gain a bunch of weight and then not do yeah. anything at the combine. Watch that be true. Uh, Richardson, who, who's got something to prove athletically, I think probably does show up and run. A guy like Stroud appears to be like an athlete kind of guy. He'd be like a guy that would show up. But there's all the reason in the world like Will Levis doesn't show up and run. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? Show up and get show up to a, a track show up to a track meet, ready to throw football. <laughs> what are you talking about? And then he ain't. None of these guys are benching, right? You know what I mean. You usually don't get your top when you have three guys in the top five picks of the class. These guys aren't going to go bench. They're not. You know they yeah. might do the throwing drills. Uh, and again, I, I I take that tape seriously because I think you train your whole life for that. That is you displaying your skill versus your peers on national television. Like, I don't know what else you wanted to put it up against because because there's a lot of things beyond that or they're outside of their control. And that's that's why almost every time you see these guys throw live after the combine is not in a controlled setting. It's in a live contest. And, you know, frequently they're throwing as the backup in a preseason game and they're standing on the fucking sideline until the yeah. named starter go- gets injured or starts playing like shit. And then they get the nod, right? So then they're thrown into the fire with – they didn't get a bunch of practice reps and shit. You know what I mean? So these quarterbacks are often put in just terrible situations that are just mismanaged poorly. Um, CJ Stroud represents – I think one of a possible two, him and Anthony Richardson, quarterbacks in this class that have the potential yeah. to excel like um, better versions of Justin Fields in terms of just even faster, even even leaner. Um, and, and a lot of the reason this is because the belief is the Bears have their guy at quarterback in Justin Fields. And that's why I brought that up. Um, as they're expected to trade out. Um, so yeah, the the Colts otherwise are still searching for a head coach, man. Yeah, which in in my opinion that that can only mean like that, coupled with the fact that you know that they've been blocking Gus Bradley from doing interviews. If you're doing that, you know, if you are going as far as blocking him from doing interviews. That, yeah. to me, tells me that whoever's going to be the next head coach is going to keep him as the defensive coordinator. Yeah, that's a good job. That's a good That's a good decision. Which, basically, you know, if you ask me, like, if it if it was going to be either Raheem Morris, uh, Wink Martindale, either one of those two, uh, the, like, those are the def- former defensive coordinators. I don't think that they are keeping another defensive coordinator – to run the defense because if you're a defensive coordinator you come in as a head coach you probably want to bring your defense like your guys yeah to do what you especially said so basically what that tells me is okay they're going to get an offensive guy yeah and i think that i'm 50 50 right now between callahan the bengals offensive coordinator and steichen from the eagles yeah like oh no Oh, no. Oh, I'm starting to believe. Okay, you're back. Ah, uh, yeah, I'm back. I was saying, like, because it is taking so long that I believe that perhaps they're waiting for Steichen to, to like, basically com- confirm him as the guy. Yeah. And they aren't telling you, – you are getting media silence because they didn't tell anyone because they are afraid perhaps, you know, that Steichen pulls off uh, Josh McDonald's and pulls – pulls out <laughs> ain't saying shit till the ink dries yeah 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 <laughs> you basically want to have oh man because you know it's i i, I honestly believe that saturday is is out by now i think that it's, oh they would i think if he were the guy they would have already named it yeah because yeah you would have already done so like you are no missing out in... on building continuity like every day that you don't hire a coach, you are sacrificing progress. Um, and I, I agree with you 100%. If they're blocking, and, and again, it has to make sense because it has to make money sense. So 
you're not bringing in a defensive minded coach if you're keeping Gus Bradley and and, and uh, Bubba. Because I guarantee yeah. you, a defensive minded coach has a defensive coordinator he wants and has a special teams guy. Yeah, he wants. Hey, you don't but want. It is ripe. The Colts are ripe for an offensive minded coach who knows how to. And I actually, the more I think about it, the more I think it's the Bengals coach because their offensive line has been absolutely fucking horrific in Cincinnati. And they're still able to drag Joe Burrow into the playoffs. Yeah, they still so, perform. I think the only reason they're keeping the, keeping their guard up at all is try to make it look like it they hadn't already made a decision. I can't I don't know. I, either way I'm happy. I'm happy yeah, every day they I'm, don't announce you know, Jeff Saturday as the Colts head coach. Yeah, I'm like, you know what? Good that's today's a good day. Today's a good day. Yeah, exactly <laughs> what I'm thinking. And... <laughs> you know what I mean? Like oh man. You know, if you if you think about it, it's actually like if you were an offensive coordinator, like what else could you ask for a team? Because you have, you know, you have the chance to draft your franchise quarterback. You have the fourth overall pick and you have an owner and a general manager that probably won't be opposed to trading up. Like, say, you know, for example, Callahan comes in and he says, OK, you know, for my offense, I would really like CJ Stroud. I think we have to do whatever effort we have to do to get him. I think that Ballard and Irsi would be like, okay, you know, stop fucking around with taking shots and let's go get our guy. And then you have, you know, you have an all pro running back in Jonathan Taylor. You have three, in my opinion, like very like elite potential weapons at, in the passing game with Michael Pittman, Alec Pierce, and Jelani Woods. You have an offensive line that should be like at least it should be much better if you get a if you get a right guard and you know, you solve the, the Ryan Kelly situation, whatever is up with him. Like, your offensive line should be fine. Like, it should play much better than it did than it did uh, this past season. And you're looking at, you know, you're looking at potentially at least taking into account the fact that we are playing a rookie quarterback. Like, this should be at least the top 16 offense in the NFL. Yeah, which I don't think is a, a big ask. Um, yeah. Again, like I said, my fear, uh, if we don't get our guy, like go up and get somebody as you get stuck where you got to take him. And I don't want to be in that spot where I got to take a Will Levis, right? Where I have to yeah. take the guy that didn't make a move on shit. Um, so I, again, I'm, I'm not, I wasn't on this boat. I, the, what I'd been saying is stay at four, know that, you know, really in front of you, Chicago don't need somebody, Houston does, Arizona don't need somebody, and then it's you, yeah. right? You should be able to get Stroud easy money. Uh, and then the more I thought about it, I'd be like, you know what? Chicago paid a lot to get – they need to get – they need to get some picks back for that number one pick. And they've got their guy. They got their quarterback, and now they just need to surround him with bodies. Yeah, I'd trade away. i trade out of that one if I'm Chicago. Now, am I saying that's going to happen? No, but that's exactly what I would – think to make happen i need more i need more firepower um and then again like we said houston pretty clearly is is a favorite to take that one that take that first overall shot um leaving leaving the colts right there i don't think arizona needs a quarterback and again i think they're in a spot where they need to take the best player um arizona needs a shot in the arm I don't think I don't think they're replacing Kyler Murray. I think Kyler Murray is like their planned long-term starting quarterback. So that is a a pick where it doesn't bother me at all, right? Where like, oh, nothing, yeah. nothing happens there that they're taking here. Look up here, right? Jalen Carter, right there. Okay, perfect. That's not a quarterback. Um, so again, why as I get heart palpitations thinking about this, if it just sits as it is, the Colts should be fine, should not have to take a Will Levis. And of course, watch me be wrong and watch him be like the second coming of Christ or something. Um, yeah, I mean, like if that's the guy, uh, I'm I'm all for whoever coach comes in. Yeah. Like for them to like be, if they are 100% sure and they come in and say, okay, this is the guy that I want to in the franchise. Like, I wouldn't even mind trading up for for Will Levis for, like, her if, if that's the guy that you yeah, truly it, believe. 
it's, you're going to have to show the coaching me. staff. Yeah. You know what I mean? The coaching like, staff and the owner like fully believes this is going to be the guy moving forward yeah. for the next 10 to 15 years. Yeah. So I'm not a, opposed to trading up. It's got to be the, it's got to be the right guy. And cause you think about the guys, the guys he's got to be able to get in with right away, the Quentin Nelson's and the Buckner's right. Um, the Shaq Leonard's like, you got to be able to get in with them guys and quick. Um, I'll just again. I'll wonder what shows up at the combine. That that'll be my driving. If I'm if I'm yeah. the Colts, I haven't made my decision. So I think a lot of people uh, that are consuming Colts content a lot, and a lot of people that are creating it are trying to create narratives like the Colts have made a decision, like about their head coach or about who they're going to pick. And I don't think that those decisions have been made because I think that these organizations are day to day. You know. Something happened to Jim Irsay. God bless, you know, bless his heart. But like, he's an old man. You know what I mean? Anything can happen. Yeah. And that could change the direction of your franchise. You know what I mean? Like, that's just real talk. Um, but also, um, I'm kind of concerned about how bad is Jeff Saturday going to drag this organization if he doesn't get the job? Because um, obviously, some stuff had also leaked out since our last episode, I think, about Frank Reich not really holding the team accountable. Did we did we we didn't really touch on this? No. Um it, it proved in my opinion that you know Frank Reich for all his deficiencies and all we criticized him in the past. Yeah. I think he's a class act. I think he's a, a much a very decent human being. I think yeah. he's an astounding leader and I wish him nothing but the best in in Charlotte and yeah, class act. Jeff Saturday, you know, having played for the organization, I don't think, I don't think he's going to, you know, talk shit or. Hopefully not. You know, hopefully like, not. We, we don't like need. Said, we don't need fear. any of that. Because like, because he'd, I'd kind of heard stuff already, right? Like, we talked among our colleagues about like he'd been making a push with his buddies in the media, and I'd said like I'd kind of questioned his power then. Because up to that point, I I had my shit on all day is on NFL Network, and I had only really seen the little Dan Orlovsky segment that was trying to you know make a mountain out of a molehill, try to give his buddy a shot. And it, the reality is like, it's just a two numbers driven league. Like those guys in their scouting departments, like I said, the scouting department, the other guys in the offense, like they're gonna want somebody with some offensive know how. And yeah, I don't, I I didn't see any ingenuity. Uh, out of Jeff Saturday, and and I honestly believe, other than like the quality of run attempt might have gone up under Jeff Saturday, it did appear like their run attempts were a little better. Um, that does not a play caller make anyone like yeah. just choosing when to run the ball it more effectively does not <laughs> make you better at being a play yeah. caller. Yeah, no, um, you've got to score touchdowns consistently and not punt or kick field goals on the majority of the time in order and, and it think about the Colts is like the Colts got to a point where they couldn't score and they were too risky and not scoring points either. Yeah. And, and it's like, obviously they had to have a regime change. Um, and again, I'll always, I'll always wonder no matter how this goes, how Strausser keeps his job of all people. That will always yeah, work. And maybe, maybe the a new head coach comes in and he gets to pick his guy, and that Strausser gets walked out the front door. But I'll, I'll always wonder how. And all that that happened last year, which I don't know about you, man. That was a pretty rough season. Yeah, yeah. Especially, uh, I, I remember the other the other day. You know, I remembered like our expectations. You yeah. know when. We recorded with with Alia to start a year. Like it feels like that was two weeks ago. It was, you know, what, what is it now? Like six months. Yeah, seven months. And you know, we we were hoping, like we had some really big expectations for this team. You know, yeah. worst case scenario, we were thinking, you know, nine and seven, ten and six in playoffs. Worst case scenario, best case scenario, who knows? Perhaps challenge for the fourth, third seed. So it, it all went like when it rains, it bursts and it, and it, <laughs> it turned into a shit show just so fast. Yeah. I think they, I think they traded Carson Wentz. I think that when they got rid of Carson Wentz, they didn't consult with some of their leadership, their team leadership, specifically the offensive line who like 
they liked him. they liked Carson Wentz. Um, so when when he's gone, and you think about what those guys have kind of been through, Quentin Nelson's starting to get some pressures, being one of the greats, right? Ryan Kelly had had his um, issue with him and his wife and, and their expected child, right? And so you think about all those major things going on, the pressure of, of possible greatness, um, the loss of a child. Then you think about um, you trade away a guy you like at the most important position too. And again, this is speculation. These were literal words from Ryan Kelly. Like we really liked Carson Wentz. And so you think about them bringing in Matt Ryan and it's almost like now that I look back on it, oh, it didn't even matter who they brought in. It never mattered who they even brought in. You you, literally, it's almost like, uh, it's like you went behind their back and got rid of one of their friends and i think it impacted their play very visibly like i said it stole the very will out of some of these guys play um and hopefully they can get it back uh and they can find a quarterback that they'll play their heart out for yeah um because that that that's what ultimately had to ch- has to change is the effort level um and i think there's a lot of tape that you could point at and say that offensive lineman gave up on that block and that's why that quarterback got hit because he gave up and when you say that and it's like man that's rough because it didn't even matter who the quarterback was it didn't even matter could have could have kept Carson Wentz for that shit you know what I mean um and especially when a quarterback's taking like pressure up the middle um and then especially once once we saw Matt Ryan under duress um and him try to step through and just kind of be sluggish with his feet and I, as yeah. soon as i saw that and i want to say that was pretty early where he tried to like hop over a guy's feet and it was like he got no air white men can't jump oh shit like nah he's gonna get destroyed um and then he he really get he really did guys like he got hit a lot um that's why you got to see Sam Ellinger. I think the more yeah. I think about it, I think Jim Irsay made the right decision to step in and say, Put Sam Ellinger in there before you end Matt Ryan's career. That man's going to die out there. If you don't do that. Yeah, they, that yeah, offensive line's might. lost its mind. I need, you know what I mean? And like, um, I think maybe, maybe the reason they didn't fire Chris Strausser is because he's a younger coach. And they're like, hey man, it's your unit that cost us this season and millions of dollars you got now you got to make it back right now hmm. now you got to prove yeah prove we should keep you around otherwise you ain't going to get another opportunity in the league your offensive line plays like shit two years in a row plays gutless um and that's the thing that's got to fit and i get it i'm sounding like old fucking man talking about no the yeah but I, I get you, uh, you know nah, yeah i, mean? I get it's you like, here it's true it's like it doesn't even matter who you draft if the tone and tenor on that offensive line just don't change overnight whoever yeah, whoever, um, whoever whoever is back there is the fucking chosen one and nobody's touching him but me and it's only you know what i mean and it's only gonna be when i high five him in the end zone you know what i mean like that's yeah. that's how it better be and i think a guy like Quentin nelson knows that um and i believe in, in like your ryan kelly's i believe in your braden smith's and like you said you get a right guard in there you get you fix anything else you know raymond continues his play the o-line can be solved and it, it can be turned around um but again, one of the things we talked about in chat, and we should probably get to talking about the Pacers and get get our um, family and friends back to their day. But one of the things about um, – oh, shit, I forgot what I was going to say. Um, oh, so keep in mind, no matter what the Colts do here, they were f- – they were four – what was it four 12 and one okay yeah yeah so that's the record conventionally and, and um unless the pacer the colts i'm sorry unless the colts get insane insane at talent development and figure out a way to win this pick in this first and get a guy that could start day one and lift an entire organization um the conventional wisdom is at best year to year uh four wins is about how much you're gonna improve so keep in mind that still has the Colts at eight eight and one that's still outside looking in I think 
Um, but that's a good year. And I think it takes again, and I'm beating my own drum, but like it takes an athlete. It's a CJ Stroud. It's a, it's a, it's a Richardson, um, healthy and, and, and the, as good a shape as possible. It's a demanding league. A lot, you gotta play a lot of games, 20 plus games win the Super Bowl, right? Yeah. So just a lot, yeah. of, a lot of stinking football to win the Super Bowl now. And that favors the athletes. And that's why you're seeing, you know, we I, we talked about on podcasts before about the rise of the black quarterback, did we not? And then yeah. here, we, here we are, first Super yeah, Bowl we ever featuring two black quarterbacks. Um, and, that, and the reason that this happens is because coaches realize what I'm saying, too. You've got to have a really good athlete at quarterback. Not so he can run away. No, because when the play breaks around, he has to be able to do something positive. Something positive has got to happen if they're guarding our receivers really well. Something's got to give. The athlete wins. The guy that's faster wins. That's how you win. And, you know, and you look at a lot, the way a lot of teams play defense, a lot of play, teams play defense, we'll let your quarterback beat us with his legs. But we're going to hit him. Hmm? Yep. As many times as we can. And one of them times is going to take him out of the game. Good luck. So you're going to yeah. score a little bit. You won't be able to do that for four quarters. Good luck. Right? Because that's exactly how I'd coach my yeah. team. Right? You take away them receiving, you take away that run game, their quarterback's going to have to beat you with his legs. Is he capable of doing that? I don't know. But is he also capable of getting his ass kicked? Because that's going to yeah. happen. Right? Um, so that's the other thing is like, while I want an athlete, I, you also got to be tough. And toughness is difficult. Uh, that's why I think like a, like a bench press is great. It's great advertising of toughness. Cause it's not fun and it doesn't like <laughs> when you do bench press and I'm one of them kids, I grew up in a weight room, spent a lot of my whole life in a weight room when the bench is the one exercise where I don't feel the muscles activating. Like I do other exercises. That's all I'm really saying. Like when you're doing the bench, it feels like you're working out your arms a lot. You know what I mean? But your, your chest is what's it. You're actually working out. Um, and, and your muscles. Anyway, you get what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, yeah, I did. But um it's not a sexy exercise you know what i mean so like squat your squat and your you know what i mean you know what i'm talking about like the bench the bench for the quarterback it's like not relevant but i think if you wanted to display toughness it would be to come in there jocked ready to rock at the combine do everything and hit the bench too you know what i mean like sh- put the put the rest of them kids on notice that you know, one of the, I, I saw Kobe Bryant say it a while back, and I'd always wondered, like, what are the workout habits of modern NBA players? And Kobe said in an interview, when I got to the league and after we won a championship, guys stopped working. And when you go and it's a summertime and you go to visit one of your friends, how are you living? And what does your exercise regimen look like? And you realize that they don't even have one. Hmm. And you wonder why there's a handful of players in history that are able to play for 15, 20 years. It's because they love exercise, mm-hmm. love working out and shit, and being a good athlete. And so that's why, like, I'm excited to see what shows up at the combine. Because, like I said, the more, I'm on a, a first step of a thousand step journey, but that's my acme is to have my quarterback selected to show up at the fucking combine and put these motherfuckers on notice that this is not a soft position. This is not a position for a svelte athlete, you know, with the big arm, the sinewy, this four, the four, seven, four to four, eight ones are getting killed. Their careers are over. Sam Darnold, Baker Mayfield, not good enough athletes. Let's just talk about it. Let's just say what it really is. You got to be a better athlete than that. And those guys, when you look back, four six eight, four seven one, and you're like, hey, four. Uh, Sam Darnold was, I think it was four eight, and and he yeah. got down to like in the in the high four four seven six range. So it's like, hey, I'm showing you. Look at data. Look who's surviving. Like even a Kyler Murray is not having a great time in Arizona. Got his coach fired. He's going to keep his job. And there's probably not going to be a quarterback on that roster coming in there and taking it from him. Right. Yeah, no. So that's what, that's what I'm saying is like, I get it uh, right now. I'm just a journalist just talking about 
this year's class. But like I said, I'm 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 motivated, right? I I want I want to be a coach of a kid in this kind of class where you show up ready. It could have it you could you could go from uh not a top 10 pick to a top five pick. Like that's that's a significant change in the amount of money you're gonna get over the course of your career. Just saying. You know what I mean? Yeah. So with that said, like we said, just temper our expectations a little bit. I'm with you on the quarterback, on the co- coaches too. I think it's either Callahan or Steichen. And, I, and the only reason you'd wait to the Super Bowl is because one of them's in it. You know what I mean? Yeah. You didn't want to tip your hand too much. But again, I'm not even, I'm for hire the guy, get it over with, get started. You got a lot of shit to do. Um, but for whatever reason, Jeff Saturday, we're playing this game. <laughs> but let's talk about the Pacers. So when we started, uh, when we kind of said like, hey, we would kind of be remiss if we didn't talk about this, the Pacers were 12 and 8. And kind of surprising the league uh, because they're young. Yeah, and they were not supposed to be this good. Yeah. When you think about all right. They're all-star point guard, hopefully like a long-term player for the Pacers, and Tyrese Halliburton is 22 years old. Um, Jesus. Basically averaging 20 and 10 as a point guard um, is like John, the return of John Stockton. Um, and then I, I just – I know you're going to get to keep Miles Turner because you signed him for a long term, but yeah. a guy like a 30 year old Buddy Heald, you got to wonder if he's long for it. Um, and again, I'm all about like the team this year, but they're 25 and 30. The five games yeah. below 500. I kind of think it's probably smarter. And, and yeah, just, you can talk about it to think more about the future than look at this season. Yeah. Because yeah. I don't want to think about, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be like, feeling some type of way about how like the Pacers right now are 10th 13 and a half games out um have lost their last or they're on a one game losing streak but they're two and eight in their last 10 and that's generally yeah. kind of how you see but two and eight their last 10 and I think for the record like six of those games Tyrese Halliburton did play so it's probably more like they're like two and two or something since he's come back yeah um but he was out and they were not they're not they're not moving the ball nearly as well uh, when he wasn't in there, and it took some Herculean efforts to get wins without Tyrese Halliburton. That's why they were not coming yeah. uh, steadily. Um, and the, and so he's looked great since he's come back. Uh, and again, I think that there's certainly potential here that maybe their season isn't over. Maybe I am jumping the gun here at twenty five and thirty. Right. Yeah. Um, if you if you ask me, you know, I'm not I'm not trading away body just on the premise that. He gets along like he seems like uh, he's Tyrese's best friend. Yeah, and I don't wanna I don't wanna do anything that you know could alienate your your franchise player. Like you wanna do everything you can to keep him happy. Yeah. Besides, you know I, I don't know what what the return would look, would look like for for Buddy, and it's not like we are deprived of of assets or draft capital, which is especially you know since you might. The, the, the Pacers are now 25 and 30. Mm-hmm. They might very well be able to, you know, at least sneak into the into the playing tournament. You get your young, young guys some playoff experience. Yeah. That's at least one game, you know, like at least a single game. Like you get into the playoff. I think that also changes the, the mentality of the team and the way they are playing. Yep. So, you know, just, you know, if you ask me, if it ain't, bro- if it ain't broke, don't, don't fix it. Just let it. You know, let it roll, see, see where it gets you. Oh, for sure. And that's what I was kind of getting to is like, yeah, it's kind of, I'm kind of iffy on writing them off or not. Um, just because I know that like they were without Tyrese Halliburton and even for part of that little two and eight stretch here that they've had, um, they were without him and they're just now kind of getting him back. Um, and I'm not necessarily saying like, like you said, that they won't even make it the playoffs or be in the playing tournament. And that changes everything. Right. And I think again, that is again, pushing, push pushing, pushing uh, fast forward um, on the franchise. And it's a good thing because that experience is, it, 
you know, when they realize like, oh, the the playing game pressure, the the postseason pressure, like it's just another game. Just got to get there. And once you get there and you've been through it and it's just another game. Right. Um, I think that it bodes well for the Colts it, or the Colts, the Pacers, the Pacers both, yeah. both in this season to be able to talk about that when, you know, if you'd have asked us before this season started, what was your outlook on the Pacers? Well, the guy that they drafted in the first round isn't a starter. So that generally tells you that um, that pick didn't go that well. Uh, and again, I'm saying generally speaking, if the guy you drafted in the first round isn't a starter, you, that didn't go very well. And then uh, also, um, you made a big move, and you you got uh, you got rid of an all star center. And I get it you you got an all star point guard for that, Jared. That's an equal trade. And then we also ended up with Buddy Hilt, so it kind of won here. Um, it isn't showing on the standings because um, Sacramento is like nine games above 500. So if we're like, who won? I don't know. The team that's like 10 games over 500 probably won. But that's not how that works. It's not, they're not, yeah. those things are not comparable. That's, they're not apples to apples. You're in different spots. Yeah, and it actually, you know, if you, I was talking about it with some friends yesterday and, we were saying like this might be perhaps the the, the very first like actually win win trade in the NBA mm-hmm. like where you I can case, remember you know yes Sacramento could not make uh, Tyrese and the Aaron Fox work together like they were clearly meant to like they, they are not players that that could play well together right and you know you got your your, your young franchise cornerstone instead of instead of Saboni, so, you know, and, and the Sacramento got their all-star center and a perfect ca- counterpart to to the Aaron Fox. So it's like, okay, both teams, like, got the one, the trade. Yeah. And I think now, like I said, as evidenced by the Pacers extending Miles Turner, two years, 60 million, I think I saw. Um, obviously, I, I felt like he's instrumental. Like, you watch him play, he is a terror uh on the especially on the defensive end like he's like god damn could you do anything in the paint like nothing like he's affecting every shot like okay and there's even been times where i'm like is he did he kind of pull up there because that would have been like the fourth possession in a row that he affected the shot and he was kind of afraid he was going to get a foul like because he was there again and could have easily just tipped flip the ball I get it you're like there's no way i just gonna call for some ticky tag bullshit <laughs> like this is how the league goes um, but absolutely worth the money. He's an excitable player. And so when an excitable yeah. player, especially a big guy, a center, which you said a cornerstone, is kind of a dying breed in the NBA anyway, um, especially knowing Victor Wimbamiana is coming into the league, right? And that's like 7-4 has to be yeah. guarded at all times. Um, you're going to need a guy like Miles Turner to be able to bang with him too. Um, but yeah, I think the Colts or the Colts, the Pacers are in a position where it's like they could give, make it to the playoff game and they can make it to the lottery too. Yeah, <laughs> right. So, and so it's like, and Math, since, ben, ben Matherin did work out. So like I said, I wanted to make sure I did yeah. also say that like normally if that guy is not a starter for you, it didn't work out. Matherin's had the time necessary to develop and has gotten the bulk of his minutes against backups. And so while yes, he could absolutely be your sixth man of the year, yeah. Homer, right? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's a uh, yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't think it's a, a biased thing to say that no. Matrin should win sixth man of the year if yeah. he can manage, of course, to to give this up. Especially now, since you know Russell Westbrook's going to uh, what is it like the Utah Jazz or the Timberwolves? Yeah, I'd kind of seen a three way trade. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if he's going to be, you know, he's going to be perhaps starting. I don't know if he's going to be right on the bench. I don't know if he's going to be getting the meaningful minutes and th- the same situation he was in in Los Angeles. So, yeah, you know, Matt is, for me, the, the, the favorite to win six man of the year. Yeah, and, that, and, that's, and that's what I'm hoping for the organization because then it, it always gives you motivation to continue to do what you were doing, right? Um, 
And I think the development I've seen out of the Pacers where it didn't, it wasn't looking good. They were a coach carousel. Their stars were not happy. You're not attracting free agents. You're not putting out a winning product. And then, you know, little flip of a pen. Here we go. Yeah. Uh, And it's night and day different. There's lots of talent. They're young with the exception of Buddy Heald. And I'm only giving him shit. Yeah. He's he's 30, buddy. You know what I mean? But when I think about the Pacers, uh, where this season started and being five games under 500 and literally kind of riding the ride in the lightning between being um, a playoff potential team and a lottery team. It's not a bad spot to be when it was like bottom of the league is what, what got us a, a Mather to begin with who I expect to be an eventual starter. Um, gosh, can, I mean, can you imagine? Cause like Mather and his consistent offense and it, I can I can understand why healed starts because threes are worth more than two, and Matherin is more of a inside out player. Yeah, me too. yeah. So, Buddy Healed shoots like four shots, scores six six points on two makes, and that same amount of time, Matherin's going to shoot like six shots and make two, and that's four points, right? But he he tends to be a little more productive otherwise. And so hopefully he gets a little more involved on both ends and that's how he becomes a starter. Um, Cause that's one of the knocks. If you really want to knock the Pacers, not great at defending opposing guards. Yeah. Um, they're good. If you try to bring it in there, it's, you know, it's one of the things I enjoy. It's how I would coach basketball is no fucking free layups. None of that shit. Right. Block it put it in the stands or put them on their ass. I don't give a shit, but nobody's taking freebies on us. Um, and that's how the Pacers play for the record. So it's not like, I can't be wrong. It's, they don't allow free buckets. <laughs> um, they're they're yeah. going to get in there and bang. Um, and also uh, our shooting lights out outside. And that's, that's pace. That's Pacers basketball. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's been, it's been enjoyable to get some spirit back. Um, Cause I think it, it's super unfortunate and depressing when like the Pacers and the Colts are terrible. Um, uh, you'd prefer fair to middling. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? You'd prefer if we yeah, were right. Yeah. Shit. We don't even have to be like great. We could just be like good in the, Hey, I, I'm, I'm good. You know what I mean? But when you're like bad picking in the top five and like uh, it's an opportunity, that's for sure. But we ought to know like with that opportunity comes some rough rides. Um, so buckle up, you know what I mean? Cause like we yeah. said, Pacers are two and eight in their last 10 and 25 and 30, five games out of 500. Um, going to have to turn this around. If it's going to mean any meaningful time in the postseason forum. Um, otherwise, like you said, again, they're looking, they're looking at a, a lottery pick uh, and that's okay too. More depth. Hell yeah. Is it more youth. <laughs> great um and 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 ultimately that i that's what's gonna win in the long run is having a lot of depth where you yeah. especially think about playing in the playoffs and having like a 12 to 14 man rotation i the more i think about it the more like excited makes me for the nba because there's some teams that are like they're so star dependent that team only plays like eight people you know what i mean and it's like if you can get to the nba finals and have like 12 to 14 people that you're willing to give considerable minutes to oh you should win that you should win that series you got all those bodies um and that's what the cool the pacers are building toward is having you know normally i see them go 11 12 deep um but you add another i mean even top half of the first round pick yeah you're going to you're going to have like basically what is like four four first round picks with your own Cleveland, Boston, and the, I believe it's the Rockets, the Rockets second round pick, which, you know, it's the 30, 31st overall pick, sorry. And, you know, basically, that's great draft capital to have. You, you said the, the Pacers have four first round draft picks? I mean, it's it's three, and then you have the Rockets uh, second round pick, which is yeah, which you just, which be, you just said like that's the yeah, that's the, the, the first 30, pick of the second round or something. Yeah, like that. 
Okay. Which is, so I didn't. Know, I didn't even know that. Thank you for enlightening me. I I didn't know that the Pacers had three first round draft picks this season. This yeah, this upcoming the, off season. That's I mean, absurd. It's kinda, yeah, it's kind of skewed though because they have you know Boston's first round pick, which is most likely going to be in the twenty eight to thirty range, and then you have the the, the Cavs first round pick, which is also going to be perhaps you know in the twenty four to 28 range, but you can get productive players or you can get decent role players in, in that spot. So you have to you have to think the Pacers try to package a couple of those picks and move on. Yeah. Yeah. That would just That's, make sense. That would just make sense because you don't yeah. need you don't, you don't need, need more bodies or first need... round draft picks. Like you don't need that many new players. You probably do need like two. Um yeah. one two guys to try out, one to stick. Because like I said, they're they're already 11, 12 guys are given minutes to already. So it's like you can only go up to 15 kids. So oh, you can't yeah. get that. And there's only so many minutes in a game. So, um, but yeah, that's that's a yeah, good I mean, spot to be in. Yeah. Being able to I, ex- I don't know. extend your center, be in a s- situation where you could potentially play in the playoffs, have a ton of draft capital, kind of not really care how that goes. Right. Like you, like you said, the, and it doesn't matter if you're losing some continuity, you have the picks to to play with. So yeah, it's a it's a nice time to be the Pacers. They've been a wonderful yeah. surprise, especially in light of what happened with the Colts. Uh the Pacers have been like a nice little surprise. And and again, when Halliburton's healthy, they look unbeatable because it, it's like they have all five players can hit from anywhere, and then they're pretty hard to score against if you're not also shooting well outside. So it's like you have, if the Pacers are healthy and Halliburton's healthy, you also have to be hitting from outside. If you're not, you're going to have a trouble keeping up. Pacers are going to blow you out because they weren't, they're not giving away free buckets at the rim. Yeah. Right. Which again, we're coming back to something we said before. So it's probably a good time to, to cut her short, but yeah. So this has been season two, episode two of the cultist where we talk about the Indianapolis Colts and the Indiana Pacers. My name is Jared Malott. I'm here with my good friend, Mateo Calise. Hey, enjoy the Super Bowl. And by the way, yeah. as we leave, who you got winning the Super Bowl, brother? Yeah, I, I think it's Kansas. I oh, think, you think it's Kansas the City? Chiefs. Yeah. Okay, pick the Chiefs. Yeah, yeah the Chiefs. I, I always say, like, you're crazy picking against the GOAT, kid. Uh, Patrick Mahomes. Um, if yeah, I'm going with him. If he hadn't hurt his ankle, I'd be with you. But I'm going with the health and and the, and the pressure that the Eagles bring on defense, that league leading. And I get it. Kansas City has been doing it, too, in the playoffs. They've been, they've been putting some pre- applying some pressure. Um, but there's people that have been doing it consistently and then people that have just started doing it. And, and again, I get it. It's crazy to bet, bet against the GOAT kid. Um, but um, sometimes in some games, all you can do is be consistent. And, and if Jalen Hurts has been anything, it's just like kids is consistent. He's like 16 and one this year. Right. Yeah. And I get it. I'm, I'm one sitting here saying it's crazy, bet against the goat kid. That's Patrick Mahomes. Um, but if there's a squad that's, yeah, if there's enough, a squad that can, that can beat him and if there is a situation done. to be in where he's going to be beat, it's, it's this one. I still think that him and Andy Reid is just way too much for any team to handle. <laughs> Yeah, he. I mean, uh, he's got he's got football acumen that they can't grade, my man. Like the Patrick Mahomes, and and that's again me fanboying over a quarterback. When you watch that man play, and you go to grade him, he'll make like two or three plays a game. Where you're like, how the fuck do I grade that? Like, yeah, hell no, you didn't do the right thing. It resulted in a touchdown though. So what the fuck are you supposed to do? Uh, great job. Don't do that again. I don't know. I don't know what to say. Um. But yeah, it's uh, I'm I'm happy to to get to sit down and talk to you. We'll try yeah, to as always. We try to kind of wait until there's something to talk about instead of just flapping our gums. You know, we were thinking about waiting until the Colts uh chose a head coach and, and yeah, Jim Mercy decided eight. to say it's going to be days, not hours. And then we we're like, everybody's gonna let one rip. Hopefully by next Jim's week, holding we have, us up here. Yeah, hopefully we have news on the front by next week. Oh, I would I would not be surprised if in the next four or five days they announce a quarterback yeah. like monday morning would be fantastic jim i would love that thank you yeah you know what i mean 
You know what I yeah, mean? It would as, be great. as soon as the confetti falls, Colts hired. You're like Colts yes! announced. Either yes! is way to steal that or... spotlight right back. As long as it's not Jeff Saturday. As long as they, oh, yeah. as they steal the spotlight by hiring Jeff Saturday. Duh. Yeah, I, I don't It'll want be a that. long <laughs> off season, my man. <laughs> Oh, God, I spoke it into existence tonight. All right, we should get out of here. All right, let's talk. Okay, yeah. We'll see you guys. Well, here we go.